Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to, uh, to this, the third installment in a new series by the Department of Economics here at the University of Oxford. Um, my name is uh, Luke Nelson. I'm a PhD student here in the department, um, working on similar topics to those which will be discussed today, and it's my pleasure uh, to chair this event. Um, so this series is all about showcasing the kind of real research that economists are doing here and how it touches many aspects that might not traditionally be associated with economics, um, but nonetheless form a core part both of academic research, but also of what economics is being done in the public uh, and private spheres. So today, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Ferdinand, who is a professor of economics here at the University of Oxford and a tutorial fellow at Brasenose College. Uh, Ferdinand's research focuses on urban and spatial economics. And today, he'll be talking about the economics of cities. Um, so the format of today's session is that Ferdinand will talk for roughly 30 minutes, and the remainder of the time will be spent in a Q&A. So throughout the talk, um, if uh, any questions come to you, please do write them in the Q&A box. Um, and then once uh, Ferdinand's finished talking, I'll, I'll feed some of these questions to Ferdinand as well as maybe sneaking in one or two of my own. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Ferdinand. Yeah, thank you very much, Luke. And thanks all for attending my lecture. It's very nice to see that so many people found the time to uh, attend today. Economics is a broad field that studies really a broad set of questions, uh, often overlapping with other disciplines. And this series of talks gives examples of the rich set of questions that modern economic research addresses. And this includes many topics that many people might not immediately associate with economics. And those are questions that look quite different from what you would have found in an economics textbook one or two decades ago. And in this spirit, I will uh, talk today about the research field of urban economics, an area of research that I've been active in. It's a young but uh, fast growing field that well studies the economics of cities. I should caution from the start, but I don't think that I'll be able to properly summarize a whole field of research in just over half an hour. And so I should stress from the start that my lecture will be brief, superficial, I, so I'm not going to go very deep on any particular research paper. And my lecture will also be a bit selective, shaped by my own interests and, and what I find interesting. And um, it does not and it cannot represent the whole field. So <laughs> a bit of a disclaimer at the start, a warning at the start. And what I will do, what I thought I will do is I will mainly ask lots of questions that are asked in this field, questions that I find interesting. And I will also provide a few brief sketches of what research answers to these questions can uh, look like. But mainly I'll be asking lots of questions. And even the selection of questions is shaped by my own perspective on the field and look different to what other researchers might have done. And with that, I'm going to try to share my slides. I have broadly structured uh, my talk such that it comes in three parts. I will first, uh, roughly 10 minutes each, I will first talk about the importance of cities and uh, say why I think this is an important field, why we address important questions that are well worth thinking about in the broadest of terms. I will then, in the second part, uh, introduce uh, questions relating the size and network, properties of the size and network of cities. So this is a set of research questions that takes a city like London as one data point, uh, looking at the population of London and, and at the population and location and how that changed over time, it takes many cities like that and asks questions about the size and location of cities, but not going into the cities themselves, but staying outside. So you could call that part across city questions. And the third part is then to go into the city and ask why are cities shaped the way they do and how do urban policies influence the shape and effectiveness of cities. So this is the rough outline of what I'm going to do today. So let me start by uh, the, the first part, what is the importance of cities and what is the purpose of a city? One urban economist, Ed Gleser, has, has said famously, cities are man's greatest invention. Is that an exaggeration? Well, maybe, maybe not. Cities are definitely important and we urban economists uh, think so. They're quite foundational to many things that we care about. Um, they are directly related to growth, 
wealth, technology, innovation, and other things that are really important and that made the modern world. And cities are just fundamentally involved in all these things. I mean, one could quibble with this quote. You could ask whether cities are an invention at all or whether they just originated. But I think we all, we, we urban economists agree that they're very important. What is the purpose of a city? What is a city? Well, one economic um, definition might be that a city is an institution that has the purpose to facilitate human interaction. Purpose of a city and, and human interaction, meaning face-to-face -face interaction. So that can mean people in an office uh, meeting, having meetings, but it can also mean if you want to eat in a restaurant that you particularly like and you can find such a restaurant in a city, well, that is also a form of human interaction. Or if you need a particularly specialized service that you can't find in a small town or the countryside, but that you can find in a city, that is also a human interaction. And a successful city is a city that makes it easy to meet other people and facilitates, uh, that facilitates human interaction. And this is because face-to-face -face interaction seems to be really of great importance to, to humans, even in the modern world. And if it works, it allows things such as sharing, learning, matching, specialization, innovation, or trade. All of these are concepts that are studied a lot in economics, in many fields of economics. And all of these are really important in their own right. And all of these contribute greatly to wealth and growth. Now, of course, uh, the city is the, is the space where these things happen. And so the cities are ultimately uh, deeply connected to, to all these things. Now, what is the relationship between a city and growth? Well, this is a, a clear one. Cities, people in cities, that is true for, for, for any country. If you look at people who work in cities versus people who work outside cities, you will find that the people in the cities are more productive, more innovative by various measures of productivity and innovation. They earn higher wages and they are willing to pay higher rents to be in the city. So that is a clear evidence that cities are connected to wealth. And, um, but that is true for, for, for uh, developed countries, but even in developing countries, cities are of great importance because there it is cities where learning, trade, uh, technology transfer and the integration in global value chains takes place. So both in developed and developing countries, cities are deeply connected to wealth growth and also consumption, tools for development. There's a large literature that also discusses this link to agriculture, which is interesting, particularly in light of what I will show you in the next slides. But um, historically, societies were very agricultural, but they have now um, become urban. And that link is deep and intimate. And I'll, I'll show you about that. This is called structural transformation. They move from, so cities are connected to the work people do. And as people move from agriculture to non-agriculture, urbanization happens. And has this changed over time is the third question. And here I have a, a graph from the uh, United Nations where you can see urbanization over time. And it's really dramatic how much urbanization has risen globally. So the world curve here is the, is, is the, shows that now just barely over half of the people in the world live in what we would call urban areas. But in a country like Japan, this is up to 90% and in, even in the United States, it's, it's uh, above 80%. As you can see, even countries in Asia and Africa, such as China and Nigeria, are catching up fast. The urbanization is rising rapidly and fast across the planet. It's also interesting to notice that in 1800, less than 10% of the world population lived in urban areas. 90% of people were agricultural and in the countryside. So it's, it's really amazing to think about how much uh, it changed, what, what it feels like to be alive on planet Earth and how much has happened. So even 200 years ago, we, most of us would have been in the countryside working in agriculture. And now we work in cities and urbanization has, has really changed a lot, what it feels like to be a human on Earth. Now, at the same time as urbanization happened at dramatic speeds, and, in the last 200 years, we also see that uh, GDP per capita's wealth increased a lot. So this is a graph that shows wealth in Britain, so the average wealth in Britain over time. And maybe a bit of a tangent here, but I like showing this graph, especially when I talk to public audience, because it's really one of the fundamental 
graphs of economics. So you can see that maybe in 1800 and before, the average person in England had an income of maybe 2,000 pounds or so. And this is comparable. So this is in 2013 prices, uh, but whereas today we are maybe at 30,000. Uh, so a dramatic change. And the, that is directly connected to urbanization. In, and the causality runs in both ways. Cities have helped to generate this growth, but at the same time, this growth has led people into the city, richer people, uh, uh, more, more urban people, because there's consumption that too takes place in, in cities. So that was just the beginning of my lecture to really argue that cities are really important because they're at the heart of of growth and wealth, things that we economists are uh, interested in. I now come to the second part, asking questions across cities, where again, we take a city like London as a data point, its size, its location, and its, its population growth over time, and study this data set. And a few very natural questions that are addressed in such a data set are, you know, why are some cities larger than others? You know, why, why do some cities grow and other cities don't grow? What are there some trends here? Is there something systematic about this? So what do we know about the distance between cities? Is it just a random process or are there other models that best uh, describe this? What factors determine the location of cities? So is it that, that if, you, if you were to you know, take a country like, like uh, the United Kingdom and remove all the people and then flatten all the buildings and then put the people back in, would they group in the same way or in a different way? Right? What is the right model to think about this? Is the location predictable? Is the growth rate predictable? So what is the right model to think about these data? And beyond just academic interest, this has clear practical implications. When we ask, so should this be managed? Can this be managed? If Africa is this, an urbanizing continent, rapidly urbanizing continent, to what degree can we predict where the African mega cities that we will see in the next two decades, where they will be? Can we manage this? Should the World Bank go and design these cities on the greenfield? Or, or is this a, a, an economic process best left to its own devices and interfering it in, in it will only mess things up? So these are the kinds of questions we are thinking about here. To summarize them all is really the last question. What is the right model to think about all this? And I'll now show you a few pieces of research that address such questions and that can help us understand them and, and lead to good answers. So the first thing is, is there something systematic about all this? And there's a very surprising fundamental fact about cities, which is called SIPF's law. Um, this is what this does is ask a very basic question. Is the distribution of city sizes similar across countries or is it different across countries? So ask yourself this. London is the biggest city in the UK. It has a certain population. The second biggest is maybe Birmingham greater area or however you count it. So you can ask, is this, is, so then you have a third biggest, fourth biggest, fifth biggest city. This exercise does the following. Take this distribution of city sizes, starting with the biggest and plot them. And then just ask, is this relative size of cities similar or different across countries? And the answer is it's remarkably similar. It's surprisingly similar. So that's what these graphs do. On the y-axis, we have the log of rank. So the rank is just one for the biggest city, two for the second biggest, three for the third biggest, four for the fourth biggest, and so on and so on and so on. The x-axis is here the size of a city. So this is really what these lines do. They just plot the simple distribution of the biggest city in a country. And the really remarkable thing is that this looks very, very similar in very different countries. It looks like a straight downward sloping line with a slope of roughly minus one. And there's no obvious reason why it should look like this. A randomly generated data set would not look like this. And you see here in, in Europe, France, Germany, Italy, UK, it looks like that. But also in Asia, Japan is here. You can see um, in, in Latin America, Brazil is here, Indonesia. Uh, is here. So it's very countries from all over the world, which all have the same shape. And that is quite surprising in a way. So surprising that Paul Krugman, another urban economist and trade economist, said the usual complaint in economics is, you know, that we have very oversimplified models that simplify reality a great bit. But then there's a, a very messy reality. Here it's almost the opposite. We have very messy models but the reality is very neat and simple. It's a mismatch. 
What this suggests, at least, is that there's, there's some processes that we can understand and should understand, and that there's some, something systematic and non-random about cities. What we can do to study this puzzle then, and what a scientist would do when confronted with such a regularity, such a pattern out in nature, a scientist might introduce an experiment and shock the system and see how it reacts. And that's exactly what this literature has done. So I'm going to show you two examples. First, a permanent shock and then a temporary shock. Consider here, for example, a famous paper by Redding and Sturm, 2012, where they, they thought of the Iron Curtain in Germany as an experiment. So what was the Iron Curtain? Well, Germany was divided after the Second World War. And the experiment is take a country like Germany that really was a unified country with, with the same national politics, with fairly similar education throughout the country, similar wealth, similar socio-demographics across the country. So take a country like this and just draw a line straight through it. And uh, what this line, one of the things that this line does is if you look at the remaining towns and cities in West Germany, some of them lose their market access, right? Because there's a wall right next to them all of a sudden. And where they had big market access, people to trade with, people to employ, people to interact with, suddenly they lose these people and they lose this market access and the world just ended in, at, this, at this new border. And so this is an experiment where you take a town and a city and you just shut off a big part of its market access and you ask what happens. Well, in this graph, shows what happens. The treatment at towns and villages in West Germany that are close to the Iron Curtain, the control group at towns and villages in, in cities in, in West Germany that are far away from the Iron Curtain, so that are not affected here. And it's really as clean as any a science experiment. You see that before the division, which happened after the Second World War, so where the first vertical line is, that the, both these treatment and control group run in parallel and develop a, along a similar trend. But once you cut off this market access, you see a divergence and the cities far away from the Iron Curtain continue to grow and develop while those that lost the market access don't and they stay flatter. So this is a nice way how we can learn how a city reacts to a loss of market access. And we might also learn what this paper also does, what sort of city reacts to this and, do, is, and it, they uncover heterogeneity and different responses according to what type of city you're looking at. So that's very useful to know because these kinds of experience can inform you about if you change the market access of a town or city, how its population will react. And moving on to my second example, this is a temporary shock. Unfortunately, some of this literature is a bit um, macabre in that it studies quite dramatic events. And, uh, but unfortunately, we have to do that because there are many more negative shocks to a city than positive shocks. So we do find examples where fire, bombing, disease heavily reduces the population of a city, but there are not many examples where a city suddenly grows and has a positive explosion of, of population. So what this paper does, Davis and Weinstein, another famous paper, they look at the impact of the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what this, so a temporary shock, a one-off reduction of population and a destruction of the capital, so the houses in, in these cities. So again, the shock happened around uh, 19, uh, after the end of, uh, end of the Second World War. So um, yeah, uh, as you can see here, between the 1940 and 1947 data point, what you also see is the population of these cities before the bombing and after, and the trend line. The trend line is uh, the trend of only the before data. So what you would have expected, uh, how you would have expected population to develop. And the remar remarkable thing here is that the population in both cities converges back onto the previous trend, such that if you only had data on the population of these cities before 1945, and after say 1960 or 1970, you might not even see the impact of the bombs because they reverted back to back on trend. They emerged back to where they've been. So in a way, this is also quite remarkable and might suggest that this is a system that is self-correcting and that can overcome sho shocks and then abs that absorbs shocks and might suggest that cities are not planable because if you try to force a city into a certain direction, it might mean revert and bounce back because maybe there's some model in the background, some economics 
that says how big Hiroshima should be. And that drives it back. I'm oversimplifying the conclusions here, but the main thing I want to point out is the contrast between these two shocks. So here we see what looks like really a permanent uh, de de deviation from trend, and here we see it bouncing back to trend. And the literature has come up with many more examples of these shocks and started to classify when such a shock leads to, leads to permanent readjustment and when it just bounces back. Something that, as I hope I've argued, is important for policy and of interest to policymakers. I now come to the third part of my lecture, which is looking inside cities, so economic questions within the cities. I should say this is maybe the part where most of modern day research happens, where the big impact papers in this literature are at the moment. And again, I'm only going to give two examples. So questions we might ask about the within cities are, so what, what is the shape of cities? You know, why, why are cities shaped the way they are? In very simplified terms, you might think some cities look like a pyramid where you have a, a rich, high density, high wage center high rent center, and as you move away from it, you get lower, lower, lower rents, lower wages, lower density. But there might be other cities that look more like maybe donuts with a center that empties out at night, but a, a rich ring around it. And so, and so the, I'm generalizing here, but so the, the general question is why are cities shaped the way they are? What influences this? Can we change this? What's the best shape for a city? And so on. And this literature also asks, what's the impact of local policies? If you build a new tube line, a new bus line, a new road even, if you change the zoning law, if you, I don't know, any urban policy, build a new park, what's the impact? How will wages, rents, um, wealth, utility, how will all of that change and react? This requires, to answer this properly, requires a general equilibrium model. And this can be quite complicated and quite computationally intensive, but there are examples now of urban econo economists that have been quite successful at writing useful models that seem to be quite close to reality on such questions. So this also asks what makes a city successful? What's the optimal zoning law? What's optimal provision of public goods? Public goods are very important in cities, you know, parks and, uh, and roads and other, so externalities, classic economic problems are very pronounced in cities, local transportation. One fact is when I said to you that the distribution of city sizes looks very similar across countries, the shape of city really varies quite a lot from one big city to another. So here you see uh, the shape of how many, seven, seven famous big cities in the world. And they are on a comparable scale. So in the bottom, you see a gray block. This block represents 100,000 people. So you can directly compare density here from one of these cities to the other. What's remarkable is that the shapes of these cities are really quite different. So Shanghai here looks like a pyramid, monocentric city, one very dense city in the middle, and then a gradient and less density as you move out, maybe Jakarta the same maybe Berlin a little bit, London a little bit, but much less so. Whereas Moscow, for example, here is just uniformly high density and much more high density than say London or, or Berlin. Even New York looks, looks fairly low density compared to Shanghai and Moscow in this direct comparison. And if you live in London or live in Berlin and you think it's very crowded, well, well compare and, <laughs> and notice the difference. So very different shapes. And there we can ask, why is that? You know, what makes some city look in, in a certain way and some other city in another way? And is it actually, is one better than the other? Is one of these shapes more useful to achieve a good quality of life and to facilitate the things we want the city to facilitate? So how do we study this? Well, one way we can, address such questions is again to look like a scientist would at shocks and disruptions and treat a city like an experiment that is hit by a shock. Again, using the Iron Curtain, same example again, uh, but this time within the city. So just like Germany was divided by the Iron Curtain, so the city of Berlin was divided and cut straight through in the middle of it. And what you see here is, so before the division, Berlin was a quite a monocentric city with one big center. At panel A, you can see what, what uh, Berlin looked like before the division. 
In panel B, you can see what left of uh, West Berlin and the center was cut off and went to the east. So this is the same as panel A, except you see what was left. So the city lost its center or what was left West Berlin. And there was quite a heavy border around it. It was possible to cross it, but it was difficult. And so in panel C, you can see what happened over the next um, 50 years. And you see a new monocentric center emerging in a different location. And then after reunification, we see again um, that, that the, the city is united and might change going forward. What makes this paper, this is another famous paper that is, is much celebrated in economics. And what makes it so great is that it provides a full general equilibrium model that models this whole city. Every person in the city is, is sort of a, a point in the calibrated model of this paper. And it models the whole wages, rents, commuting times, the decision where to work and where to live for, for the people. So it models the whole economy, but it can combine the richness of an economic general equilibrium model with the clarity and simplicity of, a, of an experiment of a shock. And it can directly compare how the general equilibrium model compares with what happened in the reality of Berlin. And so it's a, it's a very successful attempt of writing a rich model, but testing it successfully and comparing it, it to reality and seeing whether its predictions work out. And overall, I think this paper is quite successful at, at modeling the general trends that the city experienced after division. And this is a literature that will bring us hopefully close to understanding how policies change a city and enable us to provide very rich answers to how particular policies in an urban environment will change its shape and the wages and the rents and everything about it. This is another example. The first paper I'm mentioning today on which I, I worked myself or was, was a co-author myself. And this is another paper where we looked at the London underground system and just studied how the London underground system uh, changes the behavior of people in London and how people interact with the transport system. So what you see here is the famous tube map of London that uh, I hope most of you know well, but here it is corrected for geographic distortion. So the standard tube map is a highly stylized map. It doesn't represent the geography of London well, but a distorted picture for neatness and simplicity. If you have an undistorted vision, you see that it looks like this, so quite different. And what we did in this paper, we looked at these distortions and how they influence how people interact with the system and how they commute. And we, we could prove that many people are really misled by the standard tube map because and, and don't realize that there are better routes to their workplace. So what we did in this paper, we studied the strike where some stations in London were not usable for two days and, and other stations were open. So some people were forced to reconsider their choices of commuting to work. And we find that, that many people, a significant share of people, if they are forced to reconsider their choices, end up changing their behavior in the following days. So they learn something, they disrupt their habits, they update their knowledge and they behave differently. So this is a, a, an example of a paper that, that goes into great detail of studying something very, very specific of how people interact with something like a tube map, but there's also a so more concrete uh, way of saying how urban economists can learn something about the urban environment and policies that can change things there. So I've been going for nearly half an hour, so I'm uh, going to conclude now. So uh, it's a young and fast growing field. What I mean by that, urban economics used to bring together people from other fields of economics, like maybe trade and labor and others who were interested in urban questions. Now it really is its own recognized, established research field with clear models that you would would call urban models that are, that are unique to the field. It has now a very well-regarded field conference that is a great success every year, twice every year. It has successful journals, so it's now really an established field. But by young, I mean our conference are full of PhD students and postdocs, young researchers who, that are interested in such questions and that they think they want to work on them. It's really an exciting, fast-moving field. As I hope, as my talk showed, that there are important and interesting questions here with great policy relevance. I also want to point out that this is one of economics per se, such an exciting field of research, because not only do we have important and interesting questions that need an answer, we also have new tools through new data sets and 
high computing powers where we can really provide new and better answers to important questions. So it's, a, I think, a greatly productive field where we can make contributions, not only to academia, but the world. So data sets that have been used more and more, are, for example, high resolution economic data. We now have data sets where we know the address of firms and their productivity and how many people work there. We have detailed data sets such as the Oyster card data. We can follow individual people over the London uh, underground system. We also have satellite images that are increasingly used not only night lights, which are quite famously used in economics a lot now, but we have high resolution daylight images. You can get these at half a meter by half a meter resolution if you want, where you can really see houses and cars and street quality, roof qualities. It tells you a lot about the neighborhood. And there are papers now that use such data, use AI tools to digitize them, to make them useful, and then combine them with urban policies. So really exciting research happening here and we benefited a lot from the availability of data sets and computing power that, uh, that we increasingly get. Now, let me end by repeating what I said at the beginning. There are many, many questions that I did not get into and this was a highly partial walkthrough. A few of the papers in urban economics I found interesting, but there's much more that could have been said. Uh, there remains a great overlap with other fields of uh, economic research, such as trade, labor development, industrial organization, macro or even behavioral that I did not get into at all, but it's there and you see it in our journals and our conferences. The last thing I will do is I will just briefly show my sources in case you want to read more about any of the papers I've mentioned. And um, so I'm at the end of my talk and handing over to Luke again to manage the, the questions, um, please. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ferdinand, for that really uh, stimulating talk. There's lots of great questions coming in. Thanks, everyone, and do um, keep on typing them as they come to you. Um, so perhaps we can start with um, picking up on, on, on what you said at the end on, on that last slide, a question from, from Christian. Um, so Christian says that in China, the process of urbanization is closely connected with local government finances. Um, this making them think that different political economic models may lead to different urbanization models and incentives. And, and they're wondering what the forefront of research is in urban economics that interacts with other economic areas, such as public finance um, and political economy, et cetera. Yes, there, there are many papers that study urbanization, particularly in China, where it's absolutely right. It was not, I wouldn't only say public finance, but the Chinese tried for decades to manage the urbanization process and general where population lives in that country quite severely through the Huku system, right, where people were uh, strongly encouraged to live in a certain place and they lost lots of rights if they moved to another place. But I think the lesson from looking at this overwhelmingly seems to be that it's very hard to force the process, or at least China found it hard to force the population into certain areas because uh, people just were willing to accept big losses of public services to live in, say, the big cities where most of the growth happened. And so that, that didn't work out so well there. On the other hand, there are examples of projects that try to build cities in developing and growing countries that were much more successful. So I've recently published a paper where, uh, on a project where the World Bank built neighborhoods in Tanzania. So really, on, they went to a greenfield side around the big city and built entirely new neighborhoods on the greenfield sites, planning them um, from the start. And we think that these neighborhoods were actually quite successful and, and were provided wealth, wealthy neighborhoods that lasted for decades and, and were better than, than neighboring neighborhoods. So there are examples where this process works and where urbanization could be managed, but the other processes were other examples where this, where it is not, where this did not work uh, so well. Uh, great. So there are a number of questions on the kind of nexus of cities and, and COVID and the impact mm -hmm. that may be having on it. So, for example, Anna asks, um, you know, we, we note that the impacts of, uh, of shocks on city sizes um, and, 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 and how that kind of dynamics play out. But how should we think in these models about the impact COVID might have on on city sizes and, and on the importance of cities for learning and, and interaction. Uh, Anna notes that, that this talk is an example of a technological substitute for, for physical proximity. Um, and are we now finding ways to permit social interactions? And 
on a similar uh, vein, um, Alex uh, asks, you know, what effect do urban economists think COVID might have on cities and, and has it changed people's preferences perhaps as well as the, the trajectory um, that cities have? Um, uh, and finally, there's a question on related um, on, on this note um, about, um, you know, uh, again, how, how the effect that COVID might have on uh on on the productivity bonus that the cities give us so i think the answer is that while i think that there's there will be much change and some of it permanent in after covid i think the cities as a whole are not affected and i'll explain in a bit of detail so i believe what i said about the tube you know many people are stuck in habits or stuck in doing things a certain way and so shocks can be quite good to get people out of a habit and disrupt them it might lead to learning and to updating and then COVID forced us all to experiment a great deal with online communication with working from home and I think some of this will be quite useful I mean we even see it in our own environment in my case in this university here where with lots of online meetings and, and maybe some of the meetings will stay online, especially if they're, if they're of a more routine nature. On the other hand, we learned, say, that teaching, I think the consensus from my environment here was that teaching did not work so well online and that the tutorial is much more interesting and interactive and engaging if it happens in person. And we're all very glad that we're back at teaching in person. But so I think that individual organizations will well update a little bit and change a little bit. Maybe some bosses are more comfortable with letting the employees work from home now. Maybe firms have learned what works on online and what doesn't work online, and so there will be some change. But cities as a whole, I think, are not in danger from this at all. And I say this for two reasons. First, um, cities have been enormously dynamic already. COVID was not the one big shock that disrupted cities, but cities have been disrupted constantly and have changed constantly throughout the 20th century and the 21st century so far. I've written a paper on this a few years ago in, in the uh, GIA, European Economic Association, about how we just asked the question, what do people do in cities that they don't do outside of cities? And what this paper showed, it, it already changed quite a lot. So this, the economic function of cities kept changing throughout. Cities kept reinventing themselves and successfully so. And a and shock like COVID will not change this. So I think that what happens in cities might change slightly and will definitely continue to change. But as a whole, face-to-face -face interaction remains so important that it will not go away. And I already gave the example of how we experienced here how teaching is so much more effective in person. I don't think an online university will replace us uh, soon. And oh, in, in terms of research, I think it was really possible throughout COVID to continue ongoing projects and do the more routine work of updating figures and tables and running new codes and getting new data. So a running project, continuing it was quite possible. But I thought I found it personally hard to start new projects, which often emerge from the spontaneous unplanned interaction after a seminar when you just talk to someone, how, what did you think? And then you, you go have a coffee and talk more about it. And a research idea comes out of this also the big initial strategic planning of what a paper should look like and what we're going to ask and what data we're going to use. These things are much easier to do in person and they don't happen so easily in a planned online meeting. I also find that online conversations always have a forced uh, stiffness to them, almost like an agenda and, and, and they, they, they don't allow the free loose interaction that you need for certain things. So I don't think cities are in danger just yet for that uh, reason. Uh, yeah, great. I mean, I, I hope this conversation is uh, not is is more flowing and uh, and, and natural. Um, no, great. So there's another um, a block of questions about the difference between kind of natural cities and about planned cities. Um, so an anonymous attendee, and, and do leave your name um, if 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 you're happy to. Says that, that you know to some extent the growth of cities follows like a natural kind of zips law, but presumably and presumably most cities are natural with with long histories, but some are not and and they're created artificially. And how do we think about the relative success and failure of these cities, such as Canberra, for example? Um, and do they fit into a natural zips law? And on a similar vein, uh, Milan asks, what can we learn from planned cities such as Brasilia, who are potentially becoming increasingly um, popular um, throughout the world. And finally, um, again, on a similar vein, Olivia asks, 
um, you know, more moving into kind of smart cities and maybe the increased involvement of the state in planning or in corporations in providing technology, how, how might this shape what we what we know about, about urban economics? Yeah, I mean, the, the ideal thing we would want to do is experiment properly, right? So set up lots of different cities that vary in small aspects and then monitor them over time. Of course, this is impossible to do. It's just much, much too expensive and much too difficult. So we can't directly experiment easily, but we can, of course, observe these things and then, and then try to learn lessons from them. So uh, what, what we learned, say, in the paper that I mentioned just now is still on my mind about these neighborhoods. What we do is we compare, for example, planned neighborhoods that are just built on the green field with nearby other neighborhoods that are just upgraded, where the World Bank so they take an existing neighborhood and try to upgrade it. And what, one thing we learn is that it's much easier to build a functioning neighborhood from scratch on the greenfield side than it is to upgrade an existing neighborhood and to retrofit the right infrastructure. So I think it's very expensive and very costly to, to correct a city that is, that is not functioning well. Although there are examples where maybe it worked. So if you think of London, you know, it's, it's, it's a medieval city or even older, it's, it's, it's the Romans founded it. And some of the grid in central London is very old and is still there in this old form. You probably wouldn't build a city like that um, today, like that. But somehow they managed to retrofit quite a lot and, and, and make it work. And nobody would call London an unsuccessful city. I think, but it's very expensive to do. It's very difficult to do, and it's much better to get it right from the start. This is an important lesson, particularly for Africa, where now uh, urbanization is happening so rapidly. So in Africa, Africa not only experiences a massive population growth, and the World Bank has projections where we think that there will be over a billion people in the next few decades in Africa. And at the same time, urbanization pressure is big in Africa. So there's double demand increase for cities, and urban living space will have to be created in Africa one way or another. And it might be much better to plan it properly from the start, set out the layout rather than let it run and, and, and then try to fix it later. And this links to, to the spirit of the questions you asked to public goods and, and the role of policy, which is very big in cities. You know, in, in, in a standard micro course, you learn that the market is, is really great at, at solving many problems, but often there are market failures, especially when they're public goods or externalities. And in cities, these kinds of problems are really, really there and, and visible. In, this, in the case of Africa, for example, we find that a road is a public good. You know? The road connects people. Everybody wants to use the road. You need roads for the public part. Every shopkeeper at the road has an incentive to extend the shop a little bit and steal a bit from the road by making the shop bigger. So there's this contrast between the public interest of having a road and the private interest of making the road smaller. And in many cities that don't have a strong government, you find that the road space is eaten up or other public goods are eaten up and are just not there. And it's very, very difficult to retrofit this and to get this right. So there is a role for planning here and there's a role of, of thinking ahead and there's a role for local public policy. Examples of private investors that build cities exist, but usually it's so expensive. You know, building houses is expensive. Building cities is even more expensive. So there are not many examples just because it's so big that usually the planners are, are public. I'm not sure if I've answered all the questions that you raised, but hopefully a few of them that were in that uh, set. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, and Aita asks a question similar to a, to a burning question that I had, so I can I can sneakily slip one in here um, with uh, with them. Um, they ask, you know, in 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 you know, we're we're focusing here in this talk on urbanization as a tool for development, but. Um, there's also a, a, you know, a kind of a literature and perhaps a trend to work on a kind of agricultural or rural development. Um, do we find there's a kind of tension here and, and how does the kind of urban economics literature respond to, um, to, to, to that potential trend? Well, that is a great question. And that brings me to a point I should have mentioned and, and didn't, but I'm glad I can now, which is that uh, one of the biggest the most important question economists are working on is, of course, fighting poverty and fighting extreme poverty, the whole field of development economics. And traditionally, people thought of poverty as being a rural phenomenon. And many traditional papers in development economics think about rural policies. They think about agriculture and farming and fertilizers, maybe mosquito nets, maybe water provision in the countryside, transportation to the countryside. But it's, 
it's very important to stress that more and more of the world's poorest people by the World Bank definition live in cities and, and they also migrate to the booming cities in developing countries. And more and more we can think of poverty as an urban phenomenon rather than a rural phenomenon. And this trend will only increase. And of course, um, urban poverty requires a very different set of policies to, to, than, than in rural policies. So instead of thinking of fertilizers, agriculture, mosquito nests, you need to think more about public transportation in the city, work in the city, rights to living space in the city, uh, right, housing rights, you know, um, how to organize the city, about disease and pollution and other externalities. So it's a very different set of so building successful cities. By the way, what is also a remarkable fact related to this is that the pressure on cities is so big that while the world population will continue to grow for some time, as it is projected, the rural population will increase, uh, will, will decrease, not only in relative terms, but in absolute terms. So the countryside of the world is just emptying while the, while the urban spaces are filling. And that also means that um, poverty in the countryside will become less and less of a problem in the coming decades while urban poverty will remain a challenge and is something well worth thinking about and, and addressing. Talking about uh, cities and the kind of pressures, the increasing pressures that are, that are on them with they have this um, uh, increased urbanization. Uh, Aditya asks um, what they say, that they, they live in the city of Jakarta. Um, and in recent years, the government has built, um, you know, the MRT schemes, LRT schemes, um, or in general, mass, mass rapid transport schemes um, to, to allow commuting easier and, and general movement across the city easier. Um, Aditya asks if, if you have any opinion regarding this matter and, and the extent to which this is maybe a into something that the, the, the city should be investing more in, especially in, in, a, in the kind of developing countries. Yeah, so these are the kinds of questions that this literature and this field of research can address quite productively. I hesitate to give a general answer because, of course, you can't say every public investment in infrastructure is good. It depends on the specific circumstance, you know, which train line from where to where. It's very context specific. You need to do a local cost benefit analysis, and it, it might not look the same for every single new railway line you are considering. But you can take something like the Berlin model that I briefly, briefly mentioned exists. You can take such a model, adapt it to a city like Jakarta, add a rail line and see how all the wages react, how the location of people reacts, how the density reacts, works, work location, all of it. And then you can use that to inform a really subtle cost benefit analysis from it. So it will not only tell you how the average utility wage and so on rent changes, but even how inequality changes. And so we have a rich set of models that can answer in great detail how we think such infrastructure will, will change a city. And there are examples of papers that do exactly that, including in developing countries. So there was a famous paper two years ago, say about the bus line in, in Bogota, that wrote the general equilibrium model and highlighted in great detail how it changes the inequality, location, and so on of, of, of what's going on in, this, in the city. So while I can't, uh, on top of my head, give a specific answer to these projects mentioned in the question, I, we have the tools to do so if we are given a bit of time to, to, to work on it properly. Uh, great. So we uh, we've, we've discussed a little bit how kind of permanent shocks or or, or temporary shocks might have different effects on um, on city size or or, or the city structure. Um, but there's an interesting question here, um, which asks how potentially reoccurring shocks such as environmental disasters um, might shape cities and and whether they play a role in in determining the structural transformation of uh, of urban areas. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's an interesting question too. Um, one such reoccurring shock, uh, quite a big one, are uh, floods that flood cities. And I remember a paper from a few years ago in the AJ uh, applied, <laughs> which, which I contributed to, where we studied sh uh, floods in in uh, globally, actually everywhere, and we wondered what happens to a city that is fl flooded. And the interesting thing is, there are cities in this world, especially in Bangladesh and nearby areas, that are flooded every three or four years. And you might think that they would react to this, but surprisingly, when you look at night lights, they don't really. You know, they <laughs> when when they when they're hit by a flood, they go dark. Do you see that in the night lights? So there is there's 
you see the impact of the shock clearly, but soon after they're reestablished in the same place with the same, um, the same intensity of light. So there's little readjustment to this kind of shock. We, I mean, I don't want to say too general an answer. If, if, if you have a recurring shock that you know about, it might already be priced in, so to say. So we are observing an equilibrium here where this kind of regular shock is expected and already priced in. So maybe it's not surprising that we see a, a, a non-reaction there. But so maybe that is one of the things that matters here, whether a recurring shock is sort of known or not known or really new. Maybe if global warming introduces a kind of a repeated shock somewhere where they haven't been before, then we will see a readjustment, I would. I would think. But it is quite fascinating to see these coastal towns that are flooded, but don't, don't just move a little bit to nearby higher areas, as we did in this paper. Great. So, um, uh, Andrienne asks um, about, ask a question about this kind of idea of, uh, of excess primacy, uh, as we might call it in the kind of urban economics literature, that in some low income countries, um, there's just one big city um, which increasingly sprawls out uh, and maybe is associated with slums or, 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 or related things. Um, uh, Adriana specifically um, cites Kampala in, in Uganda. Um, they ask, is this kind of city growth desirable, do you think, uh, and sustainable? And, and perhaps um, how might we encourage growth in other towns um, of, from, from the big cities into other towns, um, which is related to a question by uh, Svetlana, who asks um, whether agglomeration growth is, is kind of always good and, and how do we think about smaller towns close to large cities mm -hmm. also, also growing faster? Oh yeah, these are, these are great questions. I'll, I'll take them separately. First about the primacy and then about whether density is desirable. So one thing is, I, I agree that, that so that this overcrowding of the primacy city, I see it as a short-term phenomenon arising in a growing and urbanizing country, but this is the kind of problem that will self-correct in the long run. If a city gets overcrowded, overpolluted, there's constant traffic jams, people will want to move out and there will be demand for a secondary center. And so, there, so uh, people will just move out again at some point and new cities will emerge. So that is a problem. In the long run, I don't think this is a steady state situation. What traditional urban models assume is that in an equilibrium in the long run, you should be indifferent between living, if you're at the margin, the marginal person should be indifferent between living in one city or another, because if, if one city is just too overcrowded, there will be people leaving, making it, making it easier for everyone else. So I see these as, as temporary short-term problems. The second question, whether density or just big crowded areas are desirable, many urban econom economists would actually say yes, that density is quite, quite good. Not only surprisingly, is it ecologically friendly and environmentally friendly. So people in dense areas consume less energy and, and live kind of uh, greener than outside. But also we know that dense cities generate um, higher rents and the people want to live in big cities. Especially I want to mention here a paper by Maria Flavia Harari, uh, who was a PhD student at MIT, where she wrote this paper looking at exactly this question of whether big cities or small cities are better. And she had a very clever idea. She looked at cities in, was it Indonesia or India, somewhere there. And the idea was you have an old city that is created somewhere and it then just grows over time. And some of these cities hit barriers like the sea or mountains, so they can't grow anymore. They can't become broader, so they're forced to become higher. So again, you get experimental variation where some cities grow high and dense and other people uh, cities might grow broad and flat. And she, so this is quite a nice way to find an experimental setting to ask what are the consequences of density. And she found that the dense cities are indeed provide higher, uh, higher house prices, so higher rents. And uh, also people are willing to pay more to live in these dense cities. So there's some evidence that people prefer to live in these dense cities. While productivity, I believe in her paper is roughly the same, which means that, on that so all, taken all together, the dense cities seem to be better. Fantastic. Perhaps in the final few minutes, it's a good place to end by asking um, uh, questions by Anahita and, and Emmanuel, who ask about uh, doing research in urban economics themselves. Uh, Anahita asks whether you can suggest any kind of introductory level 
resources are on, on urban economics for someone who perhaps is has a bachelor's degree or is looking to get interested in it. And similarly, Emmanuel asks whether um, or it states um, that data has always been a problem, especially in developing countries. And I think you touched upon this uh, a bit in your talk, but um, but, but he's interested in whether um, there, there's kind of other sources of data that might be available in developing countries, or or if you know all of the kind of growth in this in this field would be in developed countries due to due to data constraints. So perhaps we can uh, we can end on those. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so again, two two quite different questions. I'll take them separately. First, because we're such a young field, we don't have good established textbooks and standard textbooks like, like older fields have, where you just say, this is the textbook that summarizes the whole field. You don't have that yet, but you can find. So Ed Gleiser, whom I mentioned in my talk, he has a book, Triumph of the City, which is a nice general audience talk about uh, yeah, uh, cities that, is, that is, I think can be recommended. If you want to do research yourself, what you can look at are just the recent conferences of the Urban Economics Association. And just can, you can look at the conference program, which will give you an idea of what people are working on, what the questions are, what the papers look like. That might be a good way to get a quick overview over what the field is and what it does. And if you have a research idea to find people who are working on, on similar things and get to the research frontier on certain questions quickly. Um, the second question was about data. Well. Yes, um, data are still a problem because ideally you want very high resolution, right? Zoomed in, ideally people, you want to know where, for the city, you want to know where they live, where they work, so high resolution data, which is not always easy to get, but you can find it also in developing countries. That's one of the advantages of say satellite data. You can get it anywhere, including in developing countries. Unfortunately, they're not yet so user-friendly. They're expensive to use and hard to process, but they're getting easier every year as more and more people are, are using them. Often research is shaped by data sets that you get access to. And quite often a great researcher that comes out of someone finding a data source. But we have now many examples of high resolution data sources that have been used both in developing and developed countries. And there is enough data there to, to really <laughs> address questions in both. And many of our students and researchers have been quite successful at finding data for both. Great, thank you so much, Ferdinand. Um, we're at the hour now, and I, I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everyone's questions. There was so much um, kind of lively discussion going on, but that's that's fantastic. So it only remains for me to, to thank everyone for this discussion and to thank Ferdinand for his fascinating talk and for spending uh, his time answering everyone's questions in such detail. Um, so do return on the 8th of March for the next talk in this series by uh, Professor Barbara Petrangolo, who will be talking about uh, the economics of the gender pay gap. But until then, uh, thanks for attending. Um, have a good day and uh, and uh, yeah, and goodbye.